viewers, if you don't want to be seen on the uh, YouTube stream, feel free to close, uh, shut down your video, um, as we will be seen by the whole world, or just anyone who clicks on the video link. Um, but yeah, hello everyone, welcome to this month's lecture. We have a lecture, a free lecture, every third Thursday of the month. Uh, on the topic of astronomy. And today we have a fantastic guest, Dr. Emily Brunston from the University of York. Um, and to quote her, she specializes in the study of wibbly wobbly stars with surface pulsations and also has bigger questions about the universe. Um, so we're very excited to have her chat about it with us. Um, just for everyone on YouTube, you can ask questions uh, in the live chat on the side and we will transfer the questions to our speaker and anyone who's with us on Zoom, you can raise your hand and uh, um, ask for yourself um, live as well, but it's as you wish. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind that all your burning questions, you can think about them so we can have them at the end because the Q&A is really interesting as well. Um, but yeah, without further ado, we can have uh, Dr. Emily Brunston uh, start the conversation. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm just going to do my screen share so you guys can see my presentation as I'm speaking. So, um, yeah, so thank you all for coming along and uh, joining in this discussion. So today I wanted to, first of all, I'll introduce myself a little bit more and tell you sort of why I'm uh, interested in astroseismology and my sort of job here at York as well. So um, I am an astronomer, an astrophysicist, and I do a lot of teaching in the Department of Physics at the University of York as well. Um, one of my, also my roles is actually in, if you see my Zoom virtual background, it's, I'm hiding it a little bit with my own head, but um, I am the director of our Astro Campus, which is our uh, teaching and outreach observatory here at the University of York. And uh, so the Astro Campus is a really cool kind of um, observatory setup where we have a lot of students doing um, experiments all throughout the academic year. But we also invite members of the public um, to come along and do stargazing with us as well. So if you happen to be in the York area, we are hoping to restart our full public outreach program uh, from the new year onwards. Uh, and I'll send a link uh, in the chat at the end um, if you want to have a look. And if you join up to our newsletter uh, there, then you'll definitely find out all our upcoming events and so on for the Astro Campus. Um, yeah, so, and then in terms of my research, so I mentioned that I am an astro seismologist and uh, I study, therefore, what I like to kind of re paraphrase, if you like, is the music of the stars. So to get us started off, I thought it's probably worth uh, having a little bit of a drill down into what ast astro seismology actually is. Apart from being like a crazy good word, if you manage to get all those letters in Scrabble, uh, well done. If you do, I'm sure you'll get an awful lot of points. Um, but astro seismology is kind of one of these nice words you can break down and it actually kind of does what it says. Uh, at least what its different parts say. So astero as in relating to stars. Um, if you're very interested in uh, terminology, you'll notice that the E is there, which means you're talking about stars. If you took away the E, then you'd just be talking about the cosmos. But astero with the E means talking about stars and seismology, you've probably heard in the context of seismology of the earth, looking at things like earthquakes. And it's actually kind of the same stuff. It's the study of waves and how waves travel through different media. So when you're studying earthquakes, you're looking at how uh, they propagate through the Earth's interior. And what we're doing is kind of looking at how waves travel through stars, therefore. And then this is uh, something we really want to study. We want to understand these pulsations. Our ultimate sort of science goal then is to figure out what actually is going on on the insides of stars. So what is their internal structure? So I think a good place to kind of start is actually from a book that's coming up to being 100 years old now, but is still kind of regarded um, in stellar physics as one of the real foundational texts 
Um, and that's from Sir Arthur Eddington. He wrote um, a text called The Internal Constitution of the Stars, which is kind of a theoretical treatment of what all the physics that goes on inside stars. And what he wanted to um, kind of convey, well, what he did convey in this uh, sentence, which is actually in the very, very first paragraph of the book, is uh, his quote is, what appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? So what Arthur's kind of saying here is basically, how on earth can we ever actually uh, kind of measure what's going on inside a star? Because even our closest star, the sun, we're not like in a big rush to go stick kind of probes in the center of it and see what's going on. And of course, every other star in our galaxy, indeed in the universe, is completely out of reach when it comes to that kind of um, physics. So how on earth do we figure out what's going on inside of stars when we've got no way of physically visiting their insides? And um, in the statement and in the extended paragraph that um, Sir Arthur Reddington wrote, he's kind of saying, well, don't really know, not really sure we can ever kind of get there, but at least we can draw up some nice equations, we can have some nice theories. But then come less than 100 years later, uh, we're now at the forefront of astroseismology, which is a science that can actually do exactly this. And I think that if he were around today, Sir Arthur Reddington himself would be really excited about this field because we have found a way to make measurements of what the internal conditions of a star are by actually looking at what's going on on the surface, which is the area that we can probe. So to kind of explain a little bit more about why um, my talk's called The Music of the Stars, it's actually also the title of my PhD thesis, um, is because when we're talking about waves and the physics of waves, it's actually very, very similar to the physics of music. And so I'm going to show you kind of and introduce you to a little bit of musical theory so that when we talk about stars in a little bit, you'll kind of see some of the similarities and why we why we trying to look at the sounds of stars or the music that they make. So when we look at um, musical instruments, um, the way that musical instruments or most musical instruments work is that they are having causing something to vibrate in a particular way that's going to make a nice sound. And I've got some examples here. We can, uh, you can talk about vibrating a string on a, a violin, or you can talk about just generating resonances in the air inside a um, trumpet or other instrument uh, of the brass sort of family. The, the kind of the physics though, that of what is actually going on to create those sounds is actually very similar. And what I wanted to show you is, um, or actually to show you in kind of an audio format, is a little bit of how sound is generated in these two and how you can actually tell the difference between different sounds that you hear. So first of all, I'm just gonna play you a note. Um, I'm not really a musician. If you are, um, you might recognize the note. I believe it's the E above concert C, but that's just because I looked it up. <laughs> you can test your own um, tuning if you wish. But I'm gonna play you a note as played on a violin. Okay, you, you can you sort of hear that that's a nice note. And now I'm going to play you the same note as played on a trumpet. Now, interestingly, that's exactly the same note. It's just that it's played by two different instruments. And so you can pick up different sort of aspects of the sound. So you can tell that they're two different instruments that have played those particular sounds, even though it's the same note. If we ask a computer to play that particular note, this is what we get. Kind of sounds a bit boring and it kind of loses a lot of the richness that you might expect. And the reason why these three sort of notes sound quite different depending on what instrument is actually playing them is what I'm trying to plot in this graph here. So I'm plotting here the frequency, uh, which is related to what the note actually is and how intense a particular frequency is. So what you'll see is uh, when you have play a particular note on an instrument, and this is the instrument being played as the violin, then you get the note, which is uh, excited, 
but you also get what we call harmonics or exact multiples of that note being excited as well. So these are what the numbers are. So we've got one being the note itself and then two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, being the harmonics of that note. So it's just like twice, three times, four times, et cetera, that frequency. And you can see that the peaks go up and down, right? There's not kind of, they don't sort of all go down one after the other. Sometimes they're up. For example, eight is a bit higher than nine uh, and seven. And this uh, unique sort of pattern of harmonics is what makes a violin sound like a violin. So if we were to take the same graph and look at the trumpet, for example, then we'd get a different pattern that's being produced. Different sets of harmonics are excited to different levels. And that's what gives us the richness of sound from our musical instruments. Now we're gonna come back to this graph because it turns out that you can do a very, very similar thing when it comes to stars. And that's where some of their kind of unique music is going to come from. So the second thing we need to sort of uh, understand, I guess, from a physics perspective is when we look at pulsations and stars, is actually what are we talking about in terms of pulsations? Uh, so we, I study what we call non-radial pulsations, which mean that the actual entire overall radius of the star doesn't change. So an example of a star that has a radial pulsation is a Cepheid star, where the whole star gets bigger and smaller over time as it pulsates. So that's a radial pulsator. A non-radial pulsator actually has waves set up across the surface so its average radius across the whole star doesn't actually change. And the way that those waves are kind of set up is again analogous to uh, different types of musical instruments or different types of kind of uh, physics. So this is an example of how you would set up a wave in one dimension. You can take a piece of string, could even be a string on an instrument. You can pin down the two ends and you can set up different uh, waves on this. And they have different numbers of what we call nodes or antinodes. Nodes are the things that move a lot. Uh, sorry, nodes are the things that stay still. Antinodes are the ones that move up and down quite a lot. But you can set up different, what we call modes of oscillation, going from the very, very simplest mode in the top left and getting more complicated as you go through. So that's a wave in one dimension. Now a wave in two dimensions can look, can have different modes. And so you can't sort of represent them all quite at the same time. But what you could imagine is happening uh, for a wave in two dimensions could be like the surface of a drum. So you're, you've got your drum, the drum skin is tightly held around the rim of the drum, and then you can set up waves. Uh, in this case, we've got quite a simple wave where you get the most uh, oscillation right in the center. Or you can set up sort of quite complicated waves where you have um, most of the um, emotion happening in different places around the surface. And so you can see here that you get lots of different modes. These are two different modes for the same drum. So two dimensional waves. And then if you imagine kind of wrapping that drum skin around back around into a sphere, then we actually arrive at three dimensional oscillations. And this is what we see in our non radial pulsating stars. So this is an example of a reasonably simple oscillation in a star. So you can see that there's uh, areas of the star that move out, and at the same time, other areas of the star move in. It sort of reaches, comes back to some kind of equilibrium where it's all a nice, perfect sphere. And then you return the opposite direction. They go back in and the other parts come out. Now, this is a really a grossly exaggerated star. Stars don't oscillate on anything like this kind of scale. I think it'd be rather terrifying if they did, to be quite honest. But you can sort of see how this sets up our idea of how um, oscillations and stars, pulsations and stars, can run across three dimensions. So we now got some ideas about uh, kind of some physics of frequencies of oscillations, which is what the musical notes were all about. And we've got some ideas about modes of oscillations, which is what these geometries are kind of all about. So how do we actually go about looking for those types of things in stars? We've got two main ways that we can look at the surfaces of stars 
to tell that their surfaces are pulsating. The sort of the most, I guess, um, recent, uh, well, not the most recent way, but the most kind of, in, I guess, intuitive way that we do this is by actually looking for their changes in brightness. And this is where astroseismology has had an incredible boom over the last uh, decade or so, because it turns out that there were a lot of astronomers who were really interested in finding planets around other stars. And those astronomers were very, very well funded astronomers, which was really nice. They were able to build beautiful space telescopes. And what, uh, when you're looking for planets around other stars, what you're looking for is really, really tiny changes in the brightness of a star when a planet moves in front of it. Now, it turns out when you're looking for a pulsation in a star, you're also looking for really, really tiny changes in brightness. And so the exact same telescopes and the exact same techniques that are used by people trying to find exoplanets are really super useful for um, astroseismologists to try and find pulsations in stars. And so since um, the launch of Kepler particularly, so in the left-hand uh, image is Kepler Space Telescope that um, was in its main mission from 2009 to 2013. Uh, basically, since then, we've had two communities of astronomers who have worked really quite closely together uh, because it turns out that if you want to understand planets around going around other stars, then you need to understand the fundamental physics of the star itself as well to understand what your planet is like. Um, and so because we're using the same data, the same techniques, et cetera, we've been really close communities uh, for the last decade or so, which has been really nice. So Kepler was a massive revolution for astroseismology. We're now moving into the new phase um, of space-based telescopes. And the one that's flying and doing our kind of hard work at the moment is a telescope called TESS. So this is the space telescope on the right-hand side. And TESS is an acronym for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. But TESS is, again, a telescope that's looking for very, very small changes in brightnesses of stars. Uh, but it's really, really good for looking at pulsations as well. In terms of my particular field of research, TESS is a very exciting telescope and where I spend most of my time uh, looking at TESS data now, uh, because I also work with ground-based telescopes and TESS is an all-sky survey. So we're able to access the stars that TESS is observing from lots of observatories around the world. And I wanted to show you this uh, particular graph because this is showing, um, this is actually one of my very, very favorite stars. Uh, it's a star I've been studying for uh, probably the better part of a decade as well. Um, so what you're seeing here in the red line is uh, the brightness up on the, um, on the y-axis. And you're seeing that brightness change over time on the x-axis. So we can see that the brightness is going up and down. It's kind of got a nearly um, sort of rhythmic pattern to it. But the reason why it sort of gets really, really excited, say, uh, towards the end of the graph, is because there's not just one pulsation happening uh, at this, in this star. What's happening is there's lots of pulsations overlaid on top of one another. And uh, in the physics of waves, what we call that is we get beating of the different frequencies of the pulsations. So you get lots of pulsations and they can start to sort of interfere with each other, sometimes interfering so that they become really strong and sometimes interfering so they cancel out. Uh, so in terms of time, this has taken over about the course of a month. Um, and if you're worried about the gap in the middle, that's normal. That's just our normal downlink uh, time from TESS. So TESS turns around every two weeks and kind of downloads data to Earth, which is why we have a little gap there. Yeah, so this is actually um, a star, Gamma Doradus, which is, as I say, a star I've studied for a long time and is actually the star uh, with the whole class of stars that I um, research is named after. So it's kind of our uh, prototype star. So we can look at the brightness changes over time and we can measure how often those brightness changes happen. That gives us the frequencies of the pulsations. But if we want to go a little bit deeper, then we need to have a little bit more information about what's happening on the surfaces of these stars. 
So remember that most of the time when we're looking at stars, they're just a point source of light. Uh, we've, we, unlike the sun where you get to see the nice disk and you can see things happening, say on the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, uh, with the vast majority of stars that we observe, we just don't have the resolution to be able to uh, see a disk for any star. So when we're talking about looking at the brightness changes of stars, what we're really talking about is the overall global change for that particular star. If we want to figure out actually what the geometry is of our pulsations, then we need to find a way to break that down and actually say, well, what's happening on the kind of the left-hand side of the star? What's happening on the right-hand side? And how can we put that together into uh, actually saying what the geometry is of a pulsation? And the way that we do that is actually through spectroscopy and using the Doppler effect to actually look at the surface changes of the star. So this is where my ground-based work comes into play. So um, I started off uh, my career as a stellar spectroscopist. So specializing in using spectroscopy to understand the light from stars. And this is my kind of primary observatory. So I'm, I'm from New Zealand and uh, this is where I did my, my studies and I started off. And even to this day, I spend a lot of time observing uh, at this observatory. So this is uh, the University of Canterbury's Mount John Observatory. It's in the middle of the South Island of New Zealand. It's a beautiful place to be. Um, it's fairly close to most of the filming locations for Rohan, if you're kind of wanting to envisage the landscape a little bit more. Uh, but it's nestled in the middle of the Southern Alps. Uh, we have some really nice um, dark skies there, of course. Uh, we have a moderate size, modest size telescope, really. So you use a one meter um, size telescope. But what we do have uh, there is a really, really brilliant spectrograph. Uh, and this is the instrument that we use to actually take the light from the stars and break it down into its constituent wavelengths or its constituent colors. So like a prism breaks up the light into the red and blue parts of the color spectrum. A spectrograph is just basically a giant prism that does this on a huge scale. So we can really probe what the different colors of the light from the star is telling us. So that's a picture of me with a one meter telescope and the little kind of um, fiber behind me is snaking off. That's going into the next room, which is where the actual spectrograph is held. So how we can actually tell what the surface is doing from looking at the colors of the star comes from the Doppler effect. So here I've got our three-dimensional pulsation again. And what we can do with the Doppler effect is that if you have a, uh, some light that's coming to you from a star, if the surface of that star is moving, then the color of that light will change. So you can redshift or blue shift your light. So redshifting is when the part of the star that you're observing is moving away from you and blue shift is when the part of the star is moving towards you. And so we can actually watch, see the color change of the star by looking at its spectrum and see, and when the parts of the star are moving towards you, you get the blue color change. And then when it moves away from you, you get this uh, redder color change. Now these are really subtle effects. So we're not talking about kind of the whole star changing color. We're really talking about really, really tiny changes in our observations of the lines in the star. So it's only really been in the last sort of 20 years or so that we've actually had instruments that have been precise enough to pick up this kind of motion. Because you think about sort of the Doppler effect and motions um, of larger astronomical objects, say galaxies, then they're moving at hundreds and maybe thousands of kilometers per second. So therefore their shifts in color are fairly pronounced. When we're looking at stars, we're really talking about maybe a kilometer per second change in the surface um, that we're seeing. So we're really lucky to be able to now get down to this kind of precision. So we've got our two sets of data. We've got our lovely um, space telescope observations of how the brightness is changing. And we've got our lovely ground-based observations of how the colors of the star is changing. And the first thing we wanna pick out from those observations is actually what are the frequencies? How often 
are these stars pulsating? What are all the different, um, you, another way to think about all the different periods that you might find inside the star. So this uh, line in the blue is actually from uh, another one of my favorite stars. Uh, and you've got now frequency on the uh, x-axis and the how much or how strong the frequency is, if you like, on the y-axis. And I've put our violin spectrum here to kind of remind us a little bit of what the music uh, of the violin is doing. And you might be able to see now some of the similarities. So in terms of the star, what you see is then just above one, maybe it's, I think it's about 1.3, uh, cycles per day is the strongest frequency in the star. And that means that the star is changing um, every 1.3 uh, times in a day. So just under kind of 24 hours is its period. And this is kind of typical of the types of stars that I study. They sort of, they're on, they sort of vary on the order of maybe a few hours to a few days, which is really nice because it means that you can go observing, you can get Sort of a good set of data and just a couple of weeks of observations. So we do know, of course, that uh, of course the frequencies are really different to the frequencies of the human hearing. So when you talk about sound, you're talking about things that are happening in, for example, in kilohertz, which is thousands of times per second, whereas I'm talking about stars that change once or twice a day. So there's a huge difference in kind of scale here. So although we could kind of say the stars have different frequencies, they're not directly kind of making sound themselves. If we want to turn a star into music, then we're gonna to have to transpose that, um, that sound. But you can see here, there's some nice pulsations. You can see the, the harmonics. So we've got 1.3, kind of 2.3, 3.3. These are, kind of, these are um, extra frequencies that are coming through from our observations. And there's even interesting things happening outside of those patterns as well that we can then extract. So what we want to do is figure out what all the frequencies are that the star is telling us. And we can then figure out what the different modes of oscillation are. So what is the actual geometry of each of these individual frequencies? Uh, and so here's a couple of examples of um, different frequencies or different modes, sorry, of oscillation, getting different geometries. This one kind of looks quite fun, I guess, <laughs> having lots of oscillation going on in different axes. And this one here, this is actually kind of a simpler one, this one. It's, it almost looks like the star is swaying from side to side, but what's actually happening is one whole hemisphere of the star is moving out and one half is moving in and vice versa. So you kind of get this kind of simple oscillation. And it turns out that stars are, well, the stars that we observe are mostly doing this type of oscillation rather than the sort of freaky, wonderful other modes of oscillation that we can uh, characterize. So there's some interesting stuff we're learning about the stars that they seem to uh, uh, have mostly these simple types of oscillation if uh, they have them set up. Okay, so to recap, we've got our frequencies, we know how often our stars are pulsating, and we've got now our modes, the geometry, so what actually the surface is doing over the course of a pulsation in the stars. So the next question is, what can we actually start to learn from that? Well, the great thing is that these oscillations in stars are actually carrying information, uh, not just from the surfaces of the stars themselves, but many of these oscillations are set up really, really deep down in the interior of the stars. So I've got a little animation here, which kind of shows um, a cutaway of a star. It's got oscillations on the surface, but it's also got in the cutaway, you can see actually the oscillations are not just around the surface of the star, but they're all the way through in almost these kind of layers going into the interior of the star. Even going into the cores of stars, it looks we have different types of um, oscillations, but some stars have oscillations even inside their cores. And it's this information that's being um, transmitted from the core of the star all the way out to the surface. And just like a wave that's traveling through, say, the interior of the Earth, 
carries information about how dense the material is that it's been through. Then where these waves that are traveling to the surface of the stars carry information about what the material is like that they've passed through. And so we can use that information to then say, okay, what is the structure? Are there different layers inside the star? How big is the core? What is the density? What is the temperature? And what's been a really exciting um, sort of discovery in my field is that uh, we can actually start to look at the rotation of the core of the star and look at how that might be different to how the surface of the star is actually rotating. Because stars are not solids, right? They're, they're a type of fluid. So they can have this rotation where the core can behave quite differently to the surface. But I think it would be remiss of me to not kind of talk about um, how we're taking this information and sort of pretending that it's music without showing you a couple, at least, of examples of how you might transpose those sounds into. Maybe music is a really strong word, and maybe this is where I'm kind of being a little bit deceptive here, because it turns out that when you look at those frequencies that stars are exciting, they're not particularly musical, let's say. It's almost like stars are exciting kind of random notes, and they don't necessarily sound particularly nice when you put them together. But I will show you a couple of examples just to give you an idea. So the first one is the sun. So the study of the sun in terms of its pulsations is quite well advanced, um, more advanced than the study of kind of pulsations in other stars, purely because we can get a much better data set from the sun. Uh, and the sun does have pulsations. It has really, really low amplitude um, oscillations, which run around kind of the surface of the sun. And uh, in the field of helioseismology, or the study of seismology of the sun, then we've been able to measure these, and they're kind of on the order of about eight minutes. So quite different to the kind of few days that I tend to work with, but we can, you can look at these eight minute oscillations and start to learn a bit more about the interior of the sun. So these are the, this is a movie showing these oscillations transposed into some sound. So I'll turn this up a little bit. So these oscillations have been sped up quite a lot. I mean, you can tell because the sun is taking uh, just a few seconds to rotate instead of uh, a month or so, which it normally takes. Uh, I'll play this play the song again, but what um, you can look for in terms of what you're listening for is sometimes it sounds um, it sounds louder, and that's because you've got interference of the oscillations, and sometimes it goes a little bit quieter. So see if you can sort of pick out that difference. Oh, the sound kind of stopped. Um, oh, I can play it again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't think the sun's going to really win any prizes for kind of best contribution to your concert band, perhaps, although I'm sure there's a lot of creative individuals who could make that sound uh, quite exciting. Maybe it will be the next kind of music revolution. I'm, I'm not one to say, but uh, it gives you an idea of kind of what we're, um, we're able to do if we should transpose these uh, sounds. And then I wanted to tell you one of the most exciting things that's come out of helioseismology, which is actually using these uh, surface oscillations of the sun to try and figure out its internal rotation profile. So this is a cutaway segment of the sun. Uh, so we're looking at kind of a quarter, if you like, sliced into the sun. And what the different colors here are representing are the different rotation rates of the sun. 
Now, if we look at the surface, we've known for a very long time that the um, equator of the sun rotates faster than the poles. So in the terms of the equator, it's going around once every sort of 25 days or so, and the poles are slower. They go around every 30 days or so. And this is called differential rotation, and it's responsible for a lot of the activity of the sun. So a lot of the um, ways that the magnetic field goes a bit crazy, you get sunspots, you get flares, all this kind of stuff is related to the way that the sun's surface rotates a little bit differently, uh, depending on your latitude. So what we're interested in is saying, well, okay, we know the surface rotates at these different speeds. Does the interior rotate fast or does it rotate slow? You know, what does, what's going on on the inside of the sun? And uh, most theories sort of said, well, probably it's rotating quite quickly, more like what the equator is rotating. Um, and actually what we were able to find out in this model, as you can see this dashed line, this is kind of like the limit of where the pulsations um, are seen on the surface. But then beyond below that, which is moving now into the interior of the sun, you can see that it's basically all the same color, first of all. And that's really interesting. And it's kind of all the same color and kind of in the middle between the equator and the pole. So what this means is that the sun is differentially rotating, but only actually on the very outer layers of the surface. If you go inside the sun, you don't have to go very deep before you actually find it's not rotating differently. It's actually rotating much more like a solid object. So now we've got the solid object rotating at kind of a medium speed, and then this outer layer, which is rotating at different speeds at the pole and the um, equator. And this was really surprising. We thought that we didn't know it was going to be um, kind of a solid object, and we didn't know it was going to be kind of this medium rotation speed. And that's really useful because it helps us understand the dynamics of the sun and hopefully even allows us to start to um, produce better prediction models for how the sun might behave in its activity particularly. So we'd really like to know, you know, when is the next solar storm going to happen, for example. And it's this kind of information that can help us figure out what actually is the physics that's going on in the sun. Therefore, how do we start to make predictions from that? So that was a great um, example. I guess, um, of helioseismology and the kind of physics you can understand. And it's that kind of science that we're now trying to do with stars outside of our own solar system. And it's not just kind of um, just one sort of set of stars. What's the wonderful thing about pulsations is that there are lots of different examples of stars that pulsate at lots of different um, times in their lives and at lots of different temperatures. So in kind of the, the zoo of different types of stars that we have in our galaxy, then quite a lot of them will show some kinds of pulsations at some point in their lifetimes. And we talk about lots of different classes of variable stars, but actually ultimately many of them, we can use this, these astroseismic techniques uh, in a very similar way to try and understand what's going on uh, on their interiors. And if we can even sort of track that and say, well, this is what the interior of a star looks like kind of as it's being born or just after it's been born. And this is what the interior of a star looks like kind of during its sort of middle part of its life when it's sitting merrily fusing hydrogen to helium. And now this is what the interior of a star looks like uh, at the end of its life as it becomes a red giant or something similar. So we can kind of track different types of stars and look at their astroseismology to find out their interior structure all through the different stages of stellar evolution. And that gives us such an insight because, I mean, stars are the fundamental building blocks of a galaxy. How stars evolve tells us how the galaxy evolves and kind of ultimately how the universe evolves. So it's not really an overstatement to say understanding stellar evolution is one of the biggest kind of areas of research in astronomy um, at all. And I've got another video here which shows um, a little bit of the differences between different pulsations and stars, or at least the sounds, how they sound different as you go through different stages of stellar evolution. So I'll turn the volume up again on this one as well. Nope. Let's 
try that again, sorry. Hopefully that wasn't too loud and too uh, distressing coming through your speakers there, but uh, that gives you an idea of these different types of stars and how you can um, pick out their different characteristics just from kind of their different sounds, their different music. And it's almost a little bit like those musical instruments that I showed you at the beginning where you had different musical instruments playing, even playing the same notes sound differently. And it's just the same when it comes to different types of stars each one has its own unique uh, set of musical notes because it has its own unique interior structure. And so you can piece together, therefore, the information um, telling you a lot more about each of those stars. So I guess I just wanted to kind of uh, wrap up um, my sort of talk part of this uh, by saying this is a really exciting time. Um, Astro seismology itself is a fairly new field. Um, it's only been around for, I guess, maybe about 30 years or so, because we've only had the kind of space telescopes and the kind of ground-based telescopes to be able to do these kinds of observations to the precision we need, uh, you know, just basically in the last few decades. And it's been, in some ways, the revolution of exoplanet science has really helped us because we've been able to, in some ways, piggyback on these kinds of missions and actually get data that, I guess, is a field we would never have gotten otherwise through these amazing space telescopes. And what astroseismology is doing now, and, um, and it's not just kind of, again, piggybacking now off the exoplanet community, we're now working really closely together because if you want to understand say the temperature of a star, how big it is, how big, um, which is things that you need to know if you want to understand how big your planet is, for example, that going around your star, then you need to have some nice measurements of the star itself and astro seismology is uh, doing that. So some, one thing I never really expected in my career was that I'd end up basically working on exoplanets um, and part of my time as well as doing kind of stellar physics as well. Uh, so we've got some new, cool new stuff coming up. We've got TESS, which is a brilliant mission. Um, it is honestly one of the most revolutionary things that I've worked on. Um, and it's a little spacecraft that's um, been going for uh, three years now. And it's probably going to be going for another sort of 10 to 15. So we're really looking forward to getting much more amazing data from TESS. Uh, we've got PLATO which is uh, the next space telescope looking at this high precision kind of uh, brightness changes in stars. So we're hoping to start to look at Plato towards the latter part of this decade. Uh, it would be remiss if I didn't even mention James Webb, I guess, since it's uh, going to be launching next month. James Webb is really important for understanding different aspects and of stars, including their temperatures. And so we're going to be definitely very, very excited to get data from James Webb. And of course, our ground-based observatories are still going strong. Um, and uh, this is a picture of my uh, last um, project student who was working with me and working down in New Zealand uh, just before, um, just the winter before COVID. So we're able to now share our findings with that next generation of astronomers coming through. And what I find particularly exciting is that we're getting more and more diverse people moving into astronomy with more and more great ideas and so I think this combination of new technologies and new ideas coming from different types of people makes our field and astronomy in general, to be quite honest, uh, just really exciting place to be at the moment. So like all of astronomy, I think uh, astroseismology is looking up. So I'm going to kind of finish up there. Um, if you're I mean, please do post your questions and I'm happy to, to stay and answer questions for a little while. I will post a couple of things in the chat as well. Um, I mentioned the Astro Campus at the beginning, um, if you want to find out a bit more about that. If you're not entirely sick of my voice by now, um, then I also have a podcast um, on kind of just um, 
I guess just news that comes out in astronomy. I work with um, a uh, science communicator called Chris, and we just have a chat basically every week about some new research in astronomy and kind of delve into it and what it means. Uh, so podcast is called Syzygy, and I'll pop that in the chat if you want to have a look at that link as well. Otherwise, thank you all very much for coming along tonight. Amazing. Thank you so much. I would applaud, but I'm scared I'm going to um, ruin the microphone sounds and such. But <laughs> that was so good. Um, very exciting. Um, I've got my own questions, but we've got a couple questions from YouTube already. Um, and it's really interesting on YouTube. We've had people watching from the USA and from Greece, um, as well as Scotland, which is really nice. Um, <laughs> But yes, uh, Ronnie asks, um, uh, I'll quote the question, I'm kind of naive about science. Are light waves and sound waves measured the same or differently? That's not a naive question at all, because we do um, actually kind of, I did cross over a little bit there between the two. Um, in terms of the physics of waves, you can apply the physics of waves to either light waves or sound waves, and it's basically the same fundamental physics but the actual waves themselves are different. So the stars are oscillating and we measure the light. And then what we're doing is changing that signal into a sound for some of the things that you're hearing. So of course, stars don't make sounds and sounds don't travel in space, but light does. So that's our medium of um, kind of understanding. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we've got another question from YouTube from Scott. Uh, hello from Glasgow. I was curious about what Emily's favorite stars are that she alluded to a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, OK, this is a dangerous question. You'll have to stop me if I talk for too long. <laughs> um, so I study Gamma Dorada stars. Um, so I mentioned I did show you some of the picture of Gamma Dorada's um, spectrum. But what these stars are is they're kind of stars that are a little bit hotter and a little bit brighter than the sun. So they sort of, my sun is kind of 5,800 uh, degrees or so on the south, on the surface, Kelvin degrees, it's kind of the same by this point. Um, and Gamma Dorada stars are kind of maybe around six to 7,000. So they're not, they're just a little bit hotter. They're just a little bit brighter. Um, but these are stars that have more of these global pulsations. So while the sun has kind of little ones on the surface, these stars have these bigger ones like the animations that I showed. Um, it's quite a small class of stars. We only have kind of around about 100 really good stars that we study uh, from the ground. But um, these are ones are the ones that we're really excited about because the pulsations go so deep. They seem to come almost from the core itself. So unlike the ones in the sun that are fairly shallow on the surface, we get really deep information from these Gamma Dorada stars. So that's what makes me really excited about them. Very nice messages from the deep. I like that. Um, all right. We've got a question from John, uh, who is asking, um, who's saying that it's a very interesting subject, and he is wondering if this technique has been used to look at newly forming stars such as T Tauri, or has it just been used for main sequence stars? And perhaps you can clarify what main sequence stars are? Sure, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, we'd use this on what we call pre-main sequence stars. So main sequence is the way that astronomers describe the kind of middle ages of a star. So the point in its life when it's kind of, it, it's formed and then it sits nicely settled in this mode of kind of fusing hydrogen to helium, like the sun, what the sun is doing now, it's in, the, it's in its main sequence phase. This is kind of the main part of its lifetime. And then before and after that, a sort of pre-main sequence, post-main sequence, as you might expect. So pre-main sequence stars are stars that are still kind of part of their formation. Um, T Tauri stars are sort of towards the end part of the birth of a star. So this is by the time that they reach that stage, they're, they've come together. They're kind of just kind of sorting themselves out really as, as a star is a way to think about it. Um, so T Tauri's themselves, um, I'm not aware of any that we have that have regular pulsations. A lot of them are really violent and flares 
uh, but we do have some other slightly more evolved but just before uh, main sequence, if you like. So it's, again, the really the end part of birth um, and these stars do have oscillations and we are studying them. Um, there's a great um, sort of field of, os of uh, pre-main sequence astroseismology that we're able to probe uh, for these stars. All right, thank you very much. Um, Alistair offered kindly that I asked my question first, so I will, I will. Um, but first I, I thought it was amazing. I did love the sound of the stars. Like it did sound like a muffled, like muffled sounds of a party happening, like a couple rooms away or something. And the way that this, the, when you moved the, uh, showed the animation, it looked like they were kind of shaking their hips. Love that, that was amazing. Um, and I have a question, it might be a bit silly, I'm not sure if it does, but is there any kind of um, significant correlation between these oscillations and kind of gravitational distortion um, around the star since they're such massive objects? That is a really good question. There's no such thing as a silly question. I mean, of course, um, so any any mass that moves in the universe generates gravitational waves, right? Gravitational waves is a big part of uh, physics research at the moment. And so, of course, any kind of oscillation like on the surface of a star will generate gravitational waves. It's just that we are not anywhere close to being able to um, observe that kind of those kind of waves. So if you think about the gravitational waves that we have detected here on Earth, we're talking about things like two black holes that have collided. So two enormous masses that have done a really violent thing. And those are kind of just poking up in our little measurements here on Earth. So we're at the point at the moment of being able to only detect those really extreme gravity events. But there's no, yeah, of course, these, these, these stars will generate them. We just don't have any way of detecting them at this point. Right. And sorry, I'll, I'll follow on this question, but do you think um, if we were able to detect those gravitational waves that they would reflect this kind of pulsation from the stars? Or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. Because you've got moving mass. And so it would almost be like it's another type of wave, but it's the same physics. So again, whether it's light, sound or even gravitational waves, then you can still use the same physics to understand them. Oh my gosh, I love that. That's so interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, and then Alistair, you want to ask your question? I'll let you get the mic. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you, Laura. And thank you, Emily. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, I think that I've, I've done my best to try and link the videos that you played in the YouTube channel and, and in the chat, because I don't think the the, the, the sound through through Zoom said some of them uh, justice, but it was very interesting. I think at one point I wrote down that the first thing you showed sounded a little bit like the sort of music you would expect in the background of a Bond film when the <laughs> when the villain was moving radioactive material around inside his um, secret bunker. Um, but it is quite interesting. Um, and actually, um, one of the YouTube uh, viewers, Miltos, had the same question as I, which was um, related to um, pointing your spectrometer at pulsars or neutron stars and whether, uh, you know, whether you think you could be able to derive things about their rich internal structure in the future. That is really interesting. Yeah, so um, pulsars um, and neutron, well, pulsars as a form of neutron stars, um, they show these, they show oscillations in what we usually pick them up in radio because that's their kind of beaming. So a pulsar is the endpoint of a very, very massive star. And what happens is effectively the core of the star gets kind of left over. And it's a very dense, compact, very quite violent object that's left. But it's, um, I mean, the typical neutron star or pulsar is we're talking about something that's the mass of the sun crushed down into something that's only a couple of kilometers across. So this just gives you an idea of the crazy densities of these objects. Now, of course, we want to understand their interiors. And this is a big part of actually a few of my colleagues who do nuclear astrophysics research. They're trying to figure out, well, if you're crushing all these objects down, what is actually happening to the individual elements? Because 
atoms don't behave the same way under those intense pressures as they do here on Earth. Um, and most of the um, data that we get from them, from the variation of these pulsars, comes from that comes from a lighthouse kind of effect of their beam of radio um, signal. Yeah, I guess I would I would say that is an analogy to what I'm doing because they they have a, a type of pulsation in a sense they have this beaming, and if you look at the differences in how that beaming is changing, then you can figure out stuff about how the pulsar is changing. So I think it's a nice parallel, actually. It's so, sort of slightly different physics, but yeah, a parallel nonetheless. So do you think that their, their optical surface brightness is too low for the direct uh, spectroscopic analysis of their seismometry? Uh, yeah, I'm not of aware of any even optical imaging that's been done of yeah. neutron stars. What about white dwarfs, then, if I can pose a follow-up question? Yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay, astroseismology of white dwarfs is a, a rich field. Um, we have lots of different types of white dwarfs that are being studied. Uh, so, yeah, there's a whole group. Um, there's a great group that's based out of um, the U.S. that is really interested in different types of white dwarfs and their different pulsations. Very similar set of stuff to what I do. <laughs> Oh my, uh, right, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from Julian, who's willing to take the mic. So we'll hear him just now. Thank you very much, Emily. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, the frequency spectrum plot that you showed um, with inverse you know, frequency in uh, days to the minus one, um, you had peaks at 1.3 and 2.3 and so on. Each of these large peaks looked like it had structure within itself with sub peaks on either side of the main peaks. Is that a genuine physical effect or is that an observational artifact, please? I can, I'll bring up the picture so we can see as we're talking. Okay. <laughs> this one, right? That's it, yep, absolutely. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. It is actually mostly an observational um, structure that you're seeing in each of the peaks. Okay. So what happens is, well, um, um, how much maths would you like? Let's do, I'll, I'll tell you the maths and then I'll tell you the, the non-maths yes, version, just in case someone wants <laughs> to know the maths. Um, so the maths that we're doing here is called a Fourier transform. Yep. And what that is, is if you take a, a sine wave, so a sine curve, and you do this function of a Fourier transform to it, yep. then you end up with um, a peak, a, just a delta function, which tells you the frequency of that sine wave. Um, and so if you have lots of sine waves all together and one sort of mishmash, then you get a peak for every frequency that's in that mishmash. Um, and what happens, though, is that uh, we're not perfect observers. <laughs> so uh, space telescopes are not, not bad. Um, but when you're talking about ground-based observations, um, as I'm sure everyone who's <laughs> probably listening is aware, you have cloudy nights, you have times when you can't observe, you have the daytime where you can't observe. So we're not taking sort of continuous measurements every two or three seconds, which is what you'd really need to get a perfect spectrum. Instead, we're taking usually half an hour exposures, um, just whatever the weather is is sure. emitting and that actually is what's causing most of that underlying structure there okay thank you i hope the maths wasn't too bad but i don't, I don't like the maths <laughs> it was it was 30 years ago but i did some <laughs> all right great thank you julian and thank you emily and um, next we have a question from david who will uh, ask himself as well so mm -hmm. Thanks, um, Emily. That was a superb talk. One thing I will have to do is I'll have to reread my Open University material. I think there's some, some very good, there's a very good extract about astro seismology in this book, so I'll have to reread that. Um, the question I wanted to ask is: Can, this, can these techniques be used to probe the interior interiors of the ancient, uh, gas planets? Oh, interesting. Um, so I don't think we can do it with exoplanets because they're just we just they're just too faint. We don't get yeah. enough light from them, unfortunately. Yeah. Even uh, Jupiter and Saturn, or even Neptune and uh, Uranus. 
Yeah. It's a good question. I don't know enough planetary science personally to say what the oscillations might be. I'm not going to say they're not, they don't have them. I don't think they've got global oscillations to the same extent as a star does. But given their atmospheres, it would not surprise me if they had mm -hmm. some atmospheric oscillations that we could mm -hmm. detect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. And just a reminder that David, who just asked the question, is the reason why we have so many great speakers. So thanks, thank you for this. Mm -hmm. um, and now a question from Craig, um, who says, thanks for the fascinating insight. Can I assume that you have that you have to choose your target stars carefully? I ask because does the star rotation have to be catered for? Do double stars also stars, I'm not sure of the wording of, do double star stars also stars with close in large planets cause you problems with seismology? There's a, yeah, that's a set of excellent questions again. <laughs> so um, yes, we do choose our targets carefully. So we pick up, um, you, have, you have two different ways of observing really. You have the survey mode, which is picking up what different stars are doing. So in some senses, Kepler and TAS are in survey mode and they're just observing you know, thousands, millions of stars. And we, that's where we can pick up these stars for the first time. Then we do the ground-based follow-up. So we don't want to waste our precious time on the ground, uh, just sort of guessing whether a star is pulsating or not. Yeah, we do have predetermined targets that we are following up. Um, so that's that. Uh, the second part, remind me again, sorry, was... Um, all right, just a second. Do double stars with close-in rain, uh, close-in large planets cause you problems with seismology? Oh, right. Oh, yeah. And I remember there was something about rotation as well. Okay. So rotation absolutely is something we have to work with, but rotation helps us as well, in a sense. Um, we don't like stars that rotate too quickly because their um, spectra actually become really difficult to analyze. And we don't like stars that rotate too slowly <laughs> for a similar reason. So, but the good news is that the stars that I study tend to be these moderate to fast rotators that are kind of in the sweet spot of what we want to observe. Um, when it comes to other interference, that's a really amazing question because we do have a fairly new class of um, pulsating star, which are actually called heartbeat stars. And heartbeat stars are binary star systems where one of the star is stars are pulsating. And yeah, I'm going to do, do a hand thing here because I think it's just the easiest way to do it. But you've got two stars in the system and they're on an eccentric orbit. So at sometimes they're really close together and sometimes they're quite far apart. Now the star here is sort of pulsating. And then when in the times in the orbit, when they're actually close together, the gravity from the second star amplifies these pulsations. So they just go a bit crazy and they, they go, whoa, you know, lots of pulsations. And they become really, really strong. And then when it moves away again, they die down again. And so you get this kind of, um, blip, if you like, which is a bit like a heartbeat on a sort of monitor. So those are really exciting targets uh, that have been discovered relatively recently in the whole field, looking at those. In terms of planets, uh, the most exciting thing, I think, is you can actually use pulsations to discover planets. And I think we've got two now that have been discovered using pulsations. Basically, the gravity of a nearby planet can upset the pulsations. So even if you can't see the planet itself, if you detect changes in the way that a star pulsates because of the gravitational influence of a planet, then you can infer the existence of a planet. So it's not an efficient way to find planets. I wouldn't recommend it as kind of your um, mode of living, but it is a cool thing that we have been able to do in at least two cases. All right, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have more questions. Just let me check that we have any on YouTube. But anyway, you've had a good hour of speaking nonstop. So thank you so much uh, for that. And I actually had a good question in mind and it has just escaped me. So I might email you. 
But um, could uh, could you please share with us your uh, podcast name again so uh, I can share it with our, on our social media? Sure, it's Syzygy, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y, as in the Syzygy that's going to happen uh, later tonight in many parts of the world, well, this morning, uh, with the moon and the earth and the sun for a, a lunar eclipse. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to everyone on YouTube for your great questions. I think we can stop recording now.